Okay, so welcome to our session. My name is Miki Abara. I'm the Chief International Correspondent of NHK World, the international wing of the Pacific on International Policy. Pacific Council on International Policy. He's lectured at numerous universities in the US and around the world on issues from Middle East politics to US foreign policy. General Stanley McChrystal, who served for the US Army for over 30 years, best known for commanding the Joint Special Operations Command, spending years in Kuwait, Qatar, Iraq, and Afghanistan, now he leads his McChrystal group. Ms. Mireya Salis, the director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution. She is a specialist of U.S.-Japan relations and U.S.-Asia policy. And Lieutenant Colonel Jacob Sotiriadis, Strategic Foresight and Futures Branch Chief at the U.S. Air Force Headquarters. He's a global futurist and intelligence and geopolitical risk expert. And we are still waiting for Mr. Robert Charles, but um, we will start uh, this panel. So welcome everybody. I want to kick off our conversation with these specific questions today. What can the next large scale conflict that will involve the US look like? And what needs to be done to prepare for it? While at the same time, what should be done to avert it? Everyone has four minutes, and after the first round, we will deliberate further. So, um, could I ask Sam first, then um, Jake? So, General Sam McGriff. Thanks, Becky. And the bottom line on the future of wars, we have no idea what the next major power conflict will look like. There has been too much progress in technology in the last few decades without us having the ability to mix it all together like different chemicals. When we pour them together, the outcome is, is unclear. And so we will be in the next war before we know actually how it's going to be fought. And I think it will then be a case of iterating. The one thing I am confident of saying is the next war is going to be very different from the past in that the entire structure of nations and entities will be involved simultaneously. And that's because unlike having a rear where industry and all, now it's all reachable in real time by cyber attack, by information warfare, influence and supply chains and all will all be at risk at the same time that the front lines are. And with the spaces increasingly important, I think what we're going to find is that's a very different dynamic than past wars were. And that's going to change the nature of all of our role in it, whether we're combatants or just members of a population. Thank you. So, Jake. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here on this panel with so many distinguished guests. So I'll just follow up a bit and say that I think that the when we talk about the future and uh, as a futurist and when we, when we look at the discipline of strategic foresight uh, or future studies, uh, the basic premise is that the future as a singular entity doesn't exist. There are many possible futures and all of those futures are constantly in flux. So when we come to the security landscape of the future, um, I think it's helpful to sort of understand how we can formulate and use our imagination to develop some useful scenarios that would help us uh, prepare because we're never going to completely mitigate uncertainty in national security. As a matter of fact, what we need to do is really embrace that uncertainty and a, a method with which to do that really is applying this discipline of strategic foresight. Um, and I think there's a renaissance of this now, particularly in Washington, D.C. and other places based on the experience that we've all gone through over the past year where we've been, we've maybe gotten a mental reset on uh, accepting that sometimes the seemingly improbable actually becomes uh, uh, the uh, very plausible very quickly. So we have to ask ourselves in the defense realm, what are the weak signals and the emerging trends that we see today uh, in the environment? And that's not only looking at uh, material capabilities. Obviously, we have to talk about things like automation and human machine teaming and artificial intelligence that are going to underscore any conflict in the future uh, and the countries that are able to develop those architectures now and gain an advantage will have an inherent advantage in future conflicts. But it's not only the digital piece. 
um, the digital connectivity uh, and the U.S. military today really is on, if you will, a digital connectivity crusade to sort of network its armed forces, making information ubiquitous uh, and really overwhelming the adversary with thousands and maybe, uh, you know, thousands upon thousands of kill chains. Um, but kill chains are only as strong as their weakest link. Uh, and if we think about it, we also have to worry about our cognitive operating system, seeing the interconnectivity of events, uh, understanding uh, how things are related, sort of this idea of nonlinearity, and also understanding not just the military capabilities, but also the underlying, uh, the new ideological models that we see out in countries like China and Russia and others that are going to become uh, the primary threats. And so understanding intent uh, and uh, a lot of how these situational dynamics play out besides just the uh, strictly material, I think is going to be very important. So, um, you know, lots to think about here and hopefully we can continue this discussion uh, on this critical issue. Thanks. Great, thank you. So Jerry, you have the floor. Can't hear. I can't hear you. Sorry, I was muted. Um, okay. I have a dog barking in the background. So um, anyway, um, I want to focus on the word intractable because I think intractable may be um, in the in the eyes of the viewer. And as somebody who spo specializes on the Middle East, which is sort of where the word intractable was was invented, it's very interesting that things we thought of as intractable. Um, we may not solve them, but that we may not be bedeviled by them if we don't allow ourselves to be to the degree to which we assumed is always inevitable. So Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Lebanon, uh, Yemen. I mean, there's a whole list of intractable conflicts, mm -hmm. but we may, we've come to the realization, I think, that um, we can focus our attentions elsewhere and, and these are not major national priorities for the United States. It's interesting that the new Secretary of Defense is the former um, head of Central Command, uh, but his new life as SecDef is going to be all about Asia. And in fact, he's traveling this week uh, with the Secretary of State. They're meeting the Chinese, they're talking to the Russians and, and so forth. So I think we, and I like what the Colonel said about, you know, the future is, is you know, there are multiple futures. I'm, I'm really taken with that idea, which I hadn't occurred to me. I think we need to think harder about what we mean by intractable. Uh, when Secretary um, Clinton said we are pivoting to Asia, that, you know, implied that we had, you know, enormous control of our own destiny. So the interplay between what we can do and what we get drawn into and what determinations we make in assessing the importance of these issues is really a, it's, it's, a, it's a cauldron of very complicated issues. And we do have a degree of agency that we don't necessarily realize or exercise. Thank you. Mireya? Um, thank you very much. So I think that uh, General's point is a perfect segue for uh, my comments because I, I agree that Asia is going to be um, a major center of attention for U.S. foreign policy, not only because China is a pacing challenge for U.S. defense planners or because Asia is the most dynamic economic uh, region and host to some of the most advanced um, manufacturing capabilities in semiconductors and high tech, but also because I believe that Asia is coming together, the regional architecture is materializing, and the United States is not part of it. So I think that's the one challenge I want to uh, highlight. A lot is at stake, as uh, Gerald was uh, also mentioning, in the Indo-Pacific, and I think that this has been reflected in the very quick uh, diplomatic push coming from the Biden administration with the uh, two plus two meetings in Japan and South Korea, and now the meeting in Alaska today with uh, Chinese uh, counterparts. But when I think about uh, readiness, when I think about how can we up our game uh, from the point of view of U.S. foreign policy, I would like to highlight the following. I think that we face a challenge of credibility because from one administration to the next, we see sharp swings in uh, uh, policy priorities and tactics, and because we have stepped out of major negotiated agreements. I think we also face a test of confidence, uh, quite frankly, because we have not yet articulated a very positive case of economic engagement uh, with the region. And I think we face a test of this very careful calibration of the imperatives of economic interdependence and national security. I agree completely that defensive measures to prevent leakage of critical technology is central, 
But if there is one element of commonality between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is the idea that economic security is national security, and that's a slippery slope and very easily can lead to um, uh, protectionism. But I also think that the United States is not just about the challenges and the uphill battle that we have. We have a tremendous asset, and that is uh, that our strategic competitor does not, and that is um, the global network of alliances. And in Asia, you know, I spend a lot of my time looking at uh, Japan's role. So if I can just quickly uh, make a point, I think that we hear a lot about creating situations of strength. And I think that Japan actually is not appreciated enough how much it can support the United States in creating those situations of strength in this economic, geoeconomic competition. First of all, because after all, Japan rescued the comprehensive and progressive um, trade agreement, which in many ways does have that uh, toolkit of disciplines that addresses Chinese mercantilism. Also because Japan is a true peer competitor of China when it comes to infrastructure investment finance. So we want to reach out to developing Asia. That's a very powerful tool and Japan is doing a lot. But finally, when we think about supply uh, chain resilience, which, which is a focus today of U.S. policy, Japan has a very successful experience of reducing dependence on Chinese rare air metals uh, after the 2010 embargo. And I think that we can learn more about a policy that is not just about reshoring, but uh, diversification. But bottom line, I think these are uh, the right moves uh, for the current situation. But the bread and butter of economic integration is trade and investment. And if we are not ready to engage the region with joining mega trade agreements, we actually do risk marginalization. Thank you so much. Well, there are so many points, uh, good points that I would like to discuss. But before we go into like geopolitics, um, I want to focus, um, know about what the coronavirus pandemic has taught us in terms of you know um, how to deal with crisis, um, it's I think it's taught us many lessons and it has sort of pushed the future to arrive sooner. It's also revealed a lot of weakness of the whole structure of our countries. What has C19 taught you in your specific field? Who would like to, um, Jake? Sure. Um, you know it's interesting, Miki. The when 20 years ago now, it's hard to believe. Uh, when the 9-11 Commission released its report, uh, one of the key findings was that uh, the biggest failure was the failure of imagination. Yeah. And so when we consider that now and where we are today, you say we've, we've undergone this massive digital transformation overnight um, where we're doing distance learning for kids, uh, where now um, the entire structure of cities may look different. The uh, concept of what real estate looks like is different. And of course, national security has to encompass more than what we've traditionally associated with. It's not just military equipment uh, in geopolitics, it's biosecurity, right? It's bio data stockpiles. It's, uh, you know, powered one day by the power of quantum processors uh, where we're gonna have uh, potentially uh, manipulation of population scale data. Um, so I think when, what, one thing that we've learned uh, and I hope we've learned from the pandemic uh, is what I, what I talked about a little bit before, which is that uh, we're never going to be able to mitigate uncertainty, but it really behooves us. Um, perhaps in the scientific, technological, environmental, um, and political realm, uh, and of course the economic realm as well, and figure out which, what are the touch points uh, that we see today to our strategic planning? How can we question those assumptions that we have today uh, and perhaps look at uh, plausible, um, but maybe scenarios that are unfamiliar and maybe foreign and maybe even scary to us and ask ourselves that hard question. Uh, are we prepared? Is our infrastructure prepared to deal with any one of these scenarios? Uh, and that, that certainly holds true for the defense establishment, but I think now more broadly uh, for our country as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, the thing I, I would add is is that um, the pandemic should be a humbling experience for humankind writ large. And um, what it means is that is is that leadership and alliances, which have not been as valued in recent years as they should be, need to come back into vogue very very quickly because no single country, no single entity 
can deal with these issues alone. Borders are, are so porous and people move around the planet so so easily. We're all in this together. And things like climate change and, and epidemiological challenges provide up, I don't want to say welcome because these are tragic, but provides a special opportunity uh, to create alliances. And frankly, and this may sound a little ethnocentric, um, to, to, to emphasize the importance of, of U.S. leadership. Um, the place that everybody on the planet would go to for advice on these issues was the CDC. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, that's a responsibility we should live up to. So I think, uh, you know, I hope we've learned the lessons that we should learn from this because they hold, um, they hold true in areas far beyond epidemiology and public health to many other areas of human endeavor as well. Yes, Dan. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think one of the great dangers is that we learn the lesson to deal with COVID-19 again. And the one thing we know is COVID-19 is not coming back. I was at, had the opportunity to be on the Council on Foreign Relations task force that looked at this. And the great conclusion was COVID-19 was not a surprise that the fact that the pandemic appeared was, was well known that one would come. And Crimson Contagion, the exercise done by HHS just the previous year, had showed a scenario remarkably similar to what played out. And so we had a reason to expect it at some point. We actually know a lot about public health, but then we didn't resource it and we didn't execute what we knew. Mm -hmm. And it gets, it gets to what we're saying here. The real question is, can we respond to things can we respond to uncertain uh, emerging threats that come? Can we communicate? Can we cooperate? Can we, can, do, can we get enough people all going in the same direction so that we can make decisions that actually have impact? We've got some real bright points from this. I mean, look how quickly we prepared a, uh, a vaccine, so sort of a triumph of science there. But a lot of other levels of this, on the narrative around it, the the discipline about it, the leadership associated with it, and the alliance, the use of alliances, because the reality of COVID-19 is you don't beat it anywhere until you beat it everywhere. Right. And, and so it's got a different mindset required. Mm -hmm. Because we live on one earth. Yes, Miria. Um, thank you very much. This is a great uh, conversation. So um, some reflections of what uh, COVID-19 um, has uh, taught me, or <laughs> the things that have really stuck with me. One is that Leadership is really a test of um, competence and of governance. And it's the countries that have dealt well with the pandemic who are really coming ahead and, you know, they're de demonstrating um, that ability. I also think it's very encouraging to see Asian democracies uh, handle well, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic and show that we do not need these very intrusive systems of surveillance to keep track of our citizens and make sure that the public health is addressed. So that's a model that I think gives us uh, confidence on the benefits of um, democracy. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you know, I spend most of my time thinking about uh, international economic uh, relations and COVID-19 has been very discouraging on that front because if I were to frame it, I would say that it has put a mirror to economic nationalism. And we're seeing it's very ugly uh, reflection. It started, you know, export protectionism has been on the rise. It started last year with restrictions on personal protective equipment. And now we're seeing it with the vaccines and, you know, um, signals coming out of the EU about possible export restrictions on the vaccines. As General McChrystal was saying, until we're all vaccinated, nobody really is off the hook. So that's why it's very important to avoid that uh, temptation. And going back to the point about the centrality of coordination and alliances, I think that there's a very interesting development. We're seeing a road test for the proposition that in addition to the formal alliances, looser groupings of countries like the Quad could actually be um, problem solvers and could be uh, providing collective uh, goods. So, you know, last Friday there was this Quad Summit, the first one, and the idea and the fact that they seized on uh, the supply of uh, vaccines and tapping on the different comparative advantages of the Quad members to make sure that they can reach out to Southeast Asia with vaccines, I think is very encouraging. Thank you. Um, another point that, another lesson that we've learned from this pandemic is that there was so much, there has been so much disinformation mm -hmm. and, you know, people believe in 
fake news on the internet and you know that but that could um create a lot of danger and and then i thought what if this was a actual war what would happen and what will happen uh any thoughts on that stan i'm kind of dry on that one <laughs> Jake. But yeah, let me offer just one thought on that. And I mm -hmm. think when you talk about disinformation, you rightly pointed out, uh, you know, that's something that uh, is going to be, it is being weaponized. We're seeing it before our eyes. It has been weaponized. And it's going to be, I think, a central aspect uh, of conflicts in the future, especially when we look at the potential for deep fakes and disinformation. But I think when we, what we really need to be uh, concerned about is this idea that it's not going to be necessarily a, you know, a singular actor. Um, that's doing this. We could see a, you know, a congruence of all of our adversaries doing this at population scale, targeting all facets of our society, in particular, the weakest institutions of our society. Uh, and I think that's the real threat. Um, and so it behooves us to ask the question, how do we educate properly our society? Uh, and that's not just a national security dilemma, right? That cuts across uh, many, many streams of thought and focus areas so that we can make sure um, that we also are uh, having an educated population that can identify this. Uh, so we have to have the, the warning mechanisms in place and the means to combat disinformation. Um, but that also behooves us to have a population that understands and wants to uh, understand, you know, how to distinguish and understands what's uh, the, the parameters of that. So I think it's a very multifaceted problem set that we're going to be dealing with. Um, and it's only going to get more complex as we move ahead. Right. But, you know, like during the World War II, yeah. it was airborne leaflet propaganda in the wartime. But now it's totally different. It's happening now during the American presidential campaign, but it wasn't yet a, a war. And, you know, I could imagine that next war, it would be a lot more information oriented war, like disorient and discourage, defeat the population right by sending out disinformation um how, yes how how could the u.s um prepare for that what should be done well let me jump on that if i could first off is i think we need to be humble about what we can and cannot do mm -hmm. in terms of dealing with the effect of things like social media just look at what our own big tech companies can do with marketing and whatnot and how they can shape our attitudes. And we are not smarter than artificial intelligence. Those, those systems herd our thinking in a certain direction, even people who are pretty thoughtful and, and skeptical. And of course, the, the people who are less so are even more vulnerable. So, so that's number one. It is much more powerful than I think we want to admit, and it's certainly more powerful than the leaflets we used to see. The other part is it's already happening. It, it's happening. It's it's occurring. So there's we can call it war. We can call it competition. And the two are are blurred and we can be in the midst of something that's much more dangerous to us than than we are willing to admit long before we start doing anything about it. And so mm -hmm. I I'm concerned about it because I don't think just education will do it. I think we can educate ourselves and become more skeptical. But mm -hmm. I think we're going to need national policies. We're dealing with something on the level of uh, nuclear warfare power. Mm -hmm. And if we don't develop some doctrine and international understandings about it, then we are going to bump into each other at some point with great pain. Right. Yes. Uh, one thing is, is, is um, perhaps to review our record in dealing with this in peacetime. Um, in which well over a half a million people have died in the United States. And one could very reasonably argue those numbers would have been a lot lower had there been better um, public information and better, uh, let me flip that, better leadership and public information. If you look at the morbidity within communities of color in the United States today as a result of COVID-19, the numbers are off the chart inequitable. If you look at who's having access to vaccines, the numbers are off the chart and, and, and inequitable. And I would you know, say this is in part a problem of leadership. Uh, what the Biden administration announced this morning, which I think makes great sense, is we're going to export vi um, vaccine to Mexico. 
Um, this is, it's, it's not altruism. This is sanity. Um, you know, that border is, you know, is, is, is very open um, and always will be, no matter how many, you know, miles of walls are built. And this is a global problem. It's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's not, you know, a local problem. And so, you know, the lessons learned here, I think, are, are sobering but instructive. And um, so going on to uh, an, an issue of great power competition, there's a lot of talks about the re-emergence of great power competition, uh, China being number one rising competitor of the U.S., but it's not a comeback of the Cold War, I don't think. I don't think the old model won't work in either the realms of national security or diplomacy. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, if I can uh, jump in, um, I don't think the Cold War analogy stands because these are heavily integrated uh, countries. Mm -hmm. So um, the webs of economic interdependence are very dense and deep. And uh, whole scale decoupling would be uh, absolutely um, prohibitive. I also think that our allies are not interested in the talk of whole scale decoupling because they also understand uh, the significant costs. So it is finding that new normal. But um, I do think that we're in the midst of a profound shift. And it is because um, in this context of great power competition, governments begin to focus more on what we call relative gains. And that is, if there is an economic transaction, who benefits more from that? And this, you know, there is talk now in China and the United States, you see this percolating, this notion of self-reliance, autonomy, uh, uh, risk hedging. Those are things that are now very much part of how we think about uh, economic interaction with China. The United States has tightened its uh, screening of foreign direct investment has tightened its export controls, has imposed sanctions on uh, Chinese uh, telecom, and China is you know, pretty much ready to re uh, uh, engage in that kind of behavior. It also adopted an export control law last year. Um, so it is not the Cold War, but the uh, days of you know, uh, more abandon in thinking about economic interdependence, those are gone as well. So I think that we're you know, finding in the darkness, touching the walls, trying to find out how we come out of this, and I think what will be very interesting with the Biden administration is that they're trying to, in some ways, shift the approach in the sense that it's not all out competition where there is possibility for cooperation to pursue that. I th a climate change is one. I think that creates rich uh, functioning. So, yes, Stan. I, I'm not sure. I don't disagree, but I'm not sure that it's not Cold War again. Um, I'm not sure the Chinese don't think it's Cold War. It's it sort of matters what both sides think. When I when I do what I see of internal Chinese military writings and whatnot, there's a pretty strong nationalist uh, line. Now it's not traditional Cold War democracy, but there is a very strong line that that gets close to arrogance and. Because of that, we may find that China is in a position now where it feels that we are in a great power competition that is more than just competition. It is um, an adversarial relationship. Now, you're exactly right. I completely agree on the, the interconnectedness between economies and all. I'm not sure that's as overwhelmingly powerful as I'd like to believe it is. So I'm not saying I'm positive. I'm just saying... I worry that maybe this is Cold War and we're a little in denial. Mm -hmm. Jerry, you've spent some time in Beijing, right? Mm -hmm. how, what do, how do they see the U.S.? I think that on one hand, they would like a more reliable, predictable U.S. policy. But on the other hand, they have figured out that there are ways to take advantage of, of, of the uncertainties coming out of Washington. And one consequence of recent years is, is our alliance structure is not as robust as it used to be, and our allies don't trust us to the same degree that they did before. Um, you know, be that the, you know, TPP didn't go through, you know, there's a whole variety of explanations for that. And the one thing that the Chinese have is the luxury of time and patience, and we have neither. We have neither. I mean, already people are talking about the 2022 elections in this country, the House could, you know, there's all sorts of things 
which the Chinese are well aware of and certainly are in a position to, to take advantage of. So recent years have been very costly to us. And I think that, I, I think where we may all agree, not to, you know, to speak for everybody, is there some 21st century Cold War-ish variant that's not the Cold War that we all remember, mm-hmm. but it's something more than, you know, than, 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 than sort of ordinary day-to-day tensions. I, I don't know what we want to call it, but it's a mm-hmm. steady stream of, mm-hmm. of, 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 of distrust, uncertainty, um, and, and a willingness to be aggressive in ways that perhaps were not common. Even Chinese diplomats are much more outspoken and much more aggressive than they used to be. Why? Because they think they can do it. So I, I think this is, you know, not, not that anybody here has said this. We really cannot be complacent. Um, it's a very dynamic, fluid time. And, and um, I think there's a lot at risk. Right. Yes, Jake. You wanted to- yeah, I, I'd love to pick up on that idea of short-sightedness because, you know, it's just funny as an example. You know, in the mid-2000s, I can recall very clearly that, you know, the official uh, line, if you will, uh, in the Department of Defense was that, great power competition was essentially over and that that wasn't going to be the major focus, right? And that our threats were coming primarily uh, from terrorist groups. Uh, That doesn't mean that that wasn't a threat at the time. That doesn't mean that we were completely off base, but I just use that to illustrate the fact that, um, you know, the dynamics are certainly always in flux. uh, And we've come back now full circle uh, to perhaps we made as a nation deliberate choices uh, that now we are, I think, uh, taking a different uh, direction on. Uh, in, I think in particular with, re- with respect to China and great power competition in general, and that, that's going to include not only China, but also Russia and other powers. Um, I think it's also very important that we have a way of trying to understand some of the situational dynamics. And if we look at just in China, what's happening with neo-Confucianism and sort of resorting to this uh, this notion of Chinese uh, ethnocentric nationalism that rests upon uh, this uh, almost religious type uh, Confucianist outlook that was completely uh, taken out away uh, under Chairman Mao and now is becoming more popular in what Xi Jinping is using to stoke that nationalist narrative. Uh, I think there's a lot more to the story. And I think until we can sort of harness those dynamics in a, in a better way to understand uh, the dynamics behind the decisions and how that manifests into foreign policy and security challenges, um, you know, we're going to have a tough time. And so I think we should spend more time doing those things uh, because, again, from a, from a Western perspective, many, many actions seem uh, as if they're even against what we would define uh, as the self-interests of those adversarial countries. But from mm-hmm. their perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I want to pick up on that issue of alliance again, because uh, President Biden vowed to repair alliances through diplomacy and restore Washington's leadership position on the global stage. I would like to ask Stan, um, what's the value from your experience? What's the value of having alliances in the battlefield and how do you think they should be strengthened? Well, first off, I think they're utterly critical. They are critical on the battlefield. In Afghanistan, we had 46 nations in the coalition, and they all had different levels of strength and different levels of equipment and things like that, but they were all valuable. And the other thing that made them valuable is we were not alone. We were not a single uh, colonial or imperial empire trying to build. Coalitions don't do that. So that was first. Also, just the strength of diversity. Being forced to pull together many different perspectives in some ways makes it harder, but it also makes it a little bit more resilient because you don't have a single ideology or or strong person that takes it in an extreme way. And, And so you start to get a more common denominator. And then, of course, the reality is if you have a uh, a network of alliances, they all also bring different capabilities to put pressure points, not just on the battlefield, but, but as nations. And so if someone wants to be a bad actor in the world and they want to, for example, in one part of the world, take certain aggressive actions, if you have an alliance, you've got abilities to put economic pressure, cultural pressure, sometimes natural resource pressure, all from different angles. 
that suddenly there are ways to constrain aberrant or unacceptable behavior. Mm -hmm. If we don't have alliances, I think we're literally dead in the water. I don't think there, you can be powerful enough not mm -hmm. to have alliances if you expect to, to do well in the world. Mm -hmm. Have you been a little bit worried, you know, in recent years, how the U.S. was treating the allies? Yes. I mean, sort of the first lesson of dealing with allies you learn is you don't criticize them. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody likes the people who criticize them. And so you don't do it, certainly don't do that openly. You can do things behind doors. But also the fact that everybody matters. If you are part of an alliance and you think you don't really matter, you're not as committed to that alliance. That the beauty of Article 5 of NATO was everybody believed it. They believed that if they were attacked, they were going to be the beneficiary of mutual defense. If people doubt that, mm -hmm. if they start to think maybe you won't come, then the entire strength of the alliance is, is degraded. Yes, Terry. Can I add, so I, I enthusiastically endorse that, that point of view. And just two examples. Um, Canada has, there are two Canadians that are in prison in China because of the attempts to extradite to the United States, uh, mm -hmm. the daughter of the founder of Huawei. So the Canadians are really, really stalwart allies of the United States, and in my view, have not gotten the respect that they deserve. The second thing is it's a global world, so that when I was at NATO headquarters uh, two years ago, I was saying, so let's talk about China, which is not a typical NATO conversation item. It is now. It is now, because China is kind of knocking on the eastern door of NATO. So so things are becoming global in ways that really are are very different than what we're accustomed to. Um, so it, this is really very, very important. Mm -hmm. The overarching theme of this Horasis conference is rebuilding trust. And I believe trust is, you know, as, as Stan said, indispensable in keeping one's ally. And this is something that won't change. Even the concept or the formation of the alliances change. Um, how should the trust be strengthened, Mireya? Well, I think that that is uh, critical. Um, the U.S.-Japan alliance, actually, uh, compared to other alliances, um, was not as affected by America first. Uh, I think that a lot of our allies were worried about this instrumental transactional approach to alliances. And um, all things considered, I think that uh, Japan managed well those years. But nevertheless, the alliance did take a hit. And I think that, uh, first of all, uh, reinforcing the fact that this partnership is based on shared values. It's very important. I always believe that the U.S.-Japan alliance is so robust because it's also based on people-to-people uh, -people exchanges, and that means that they are advocates of these bonds spread throughout these countries, and this guarantees that even on lean times, we don't lose sight of the value of this alliance. And I also think you rebuild trust by uh, consulting and coordinating with your allies and making sure that you're not just trying to impose uh, your way or come to talks about, you know, overinflated um, uh, burden sharing, uh, you know, expecting from one year to the next just to go four times uh, bigger in the ask. I think that those were very um, concerning uh, moves. So that's why I think that the way in which we've seen this recent diplomatic um uh, push in Asia, the fact that, you know, uh, you have first the two and two in Tokyo and then Seoul, and then you engage with the Chinese is a way to go because first you uh, make sure that you're on the same page as much as you can with your allies, and then you uh, open the conversation with the Chinese. So I think those are some of the right steps. Mm -hmm. Jake, you're in charge of strategic foresight, which is not um, a common, you know, concept. But um, I know you're not uh, predicting the future, but what would be a key to keep this world uh, peaceful? What would be a key to, you know, avert a big war? Well, let me just address one point about um, the alliances that we've been talking mm -hmm. about. I'll okay. come directly to your question, Miki. And that's mm -hmm. that if you just look at, we've been talking a lot about China and the United States. Just look at how differently China and the United States conceptualize alliances. And the Chinese don't have the kinds of alliances that the United States has. And frankly, they want it that way. 
uh, because they view alliances as a burden. They don't view them as a force multiplier in the sense that we do. Uh, they'd rather have tributary type states uh, rather than alliances because in alliances you have to give and take. You have to make compromises. Uh, you have to come to your allies' aid. You have to support each other. Um, and I don't believe that that model really fits in uh, with, uh, I think, the Chinese vision uh, for how they want to do business. And so I think that's an important distinction that we should make. It's a national security advantage uh, that the United States and its allies have. Uh, and I think we should never lose sight of that. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of averting it, uh, I mean, this is something that is I don't know if we're ever going to be able to avert conflict and we're never going to you know, be able to avert uh, that uncertainty. Um, but I'll come back to the point that uh, one of the ways we can, I think, mitigate or at least be prepared for at a minimum. Mm -hmm. I think that's the responsibility that we that we have mm -hmm. is to try to understand some of the fault lines in our own assumptions, um, because as we make budgets and plans, and strategies and concepts and alliances, they're predicated on a particular vision of the future. Um, but what we've seen is that vision of the future is not always uh, going to come to play. And so when are, are we going to be able to deal with a whole host of scenarios if we have you know, a continuation, if we have a systemic collapse, if we have a systemic transformation or a discipline scenario that we're actually dealing with right now where we have now sort of a correction in the global economy and a lot of the domestic dynamics that we're seeing. Um, you know, I don't know that we're always prepared to deal with those kinds of things or at least to turn as quickly as we need to to react. And so I think to maintain that sort of imaginative capacity, the cognitive capacity to always uh, stay ahead of the game as much as we can and to define things in terms of a macro view. You know, it's very easy to get bogged down with what's right here. And that's that's how we often declare small victory. It's much more difficult to take the 20 or 30 year look. Mm -hmm. Can I ask the rest of the panelists for a closing comment as to what would be a key to then mitigate? Did we lose Mickey? <laughs> oh no! Okay. What was the key to what? <laughs> the Wi-Fi may have uh, may have abandoned her, but since we're about to finish, she was asking us for closing words of wisdom. So. I would encourage the three of you to have your closing words of wisdom because we have about two minutes till we're, yeah. we're done. So, please take her. Go ahead. I'm. I'm, I'm going to start. <laughs> Uh, well, I do think that, you know, uh, we've been talking about all these international issues, but um, at the end, I think that um, healing at home and getting past the pandemic and uh, making sure that the economy uh, restarts. And, you know, we didn't touch uh, hyperpolarization, but if uh, misinformation th thrives in this uh, hyperpartisanship. Um, so those are issues that I think are uh, mandatory. We're going to think about how the U.S. Uh, um, uh, leads in the world. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in after you. I, I think you've nailed it. I think the United States has to prove it can govern itself and do it credibly. We've got to be able to make policies, execute those policies and follow through. And if we can't get enough bipartisanship and functionality to do that, then we'll, we'll be very difficult, hard pressed to make things happen in the world. Colonel, over to you, sir. Well, I'll just Here echo those got, remarks. Is everybody say that else absolutely. off now? We're here and we're, 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 we're wrapping, <laughs> offering our closing remarks, as you suggested. Mm. So, uh, now it's past 45 minutes. Uh -huh. I'll just wait for everybody to come back. We're all here. Yeah. We were, full, we were kicked out of this session. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, oh. Well, listen, thanks, everybody. It was a pleasure, everybody. Yeah, thank, pleasure. You. thank you, thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Love to stay in contact. Please, sir. Please, thank you. Yeah. So, well, well, see you. San nice Diego. Time. Thank you, Mary. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Mickey San. So thank you everybody to um, for watching our panel. I'm sorry this has happened, but I will stop streaming now. <laughs>